Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, uh, uh, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And we are discussing the subject of heaven. This is episode 16 in this <laughs> series. Uh, if you haven't seen the first 15 episodes, they're available on my channel, Sin City Preacher. I, I hope you will go back and watch them. Uh, it's quite an undertaking studying heaven because we've already studied 15 episodes, two hours each at 30 hours. And to some people that is probably shocking <laughs> to think that you could talk for, about heaven for 30 hours and yet we're only about halfway through. So that's, that's how much there is to say about heaven and learn about heaven. Uh, but uh, let me uh, first introduce my co-panelist here, uh, Brother Eric. Want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Jesus Knight 72 here again, and I'm uh, just loving this talk about heaven. It's very, very spiritual, very, very building up, very building up. So if you're not watching uh, these episodes, you're really missing out. Okay. Thank you, Eric. I always appreciate you being here with me. Uh, we're using a book written by Andy, Randy Alcorn, and the title is Heaven, and, and uh, that's available in the bookstores if you want to go buy it, but we're going through the book and discussing it. And right now, let's say, uh, I'll just pick up where we left off last time. Oh, by the way, before I go on, when you said Jesus Night 72, I was really happy to learn the meaning of your YouTube username, uh, Jesus Night 72. Uh, for anybody watching now, go watch the last video and you'll learn how Eric came up with that name and the significance of it. So that was, that's a really beautiful uh, picture of, uh, well, I don't want to tell him too much. Make him go back and look. <laughs> yeah, make him go watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it says, uh, some have portrayed the beatific vision as a pursuit in which every person seeks God individually. Uh, it is characteristic of our Western cultural independence that we think of heaven in highly individualized ways. But God also views us corporately as Christ's bride, as part of a great eternal community in which we'll love our Lord together and undertake cooperative pursuits for His glory. We will always be individuals, but heaven will not be a place of individualism. We aren't individual brides of Christ. We are collectively the bride of Christ. Christ is not a polygamist. He will be married to one bride, not millions. We belong to each other and need each other. We should guard not only our own purity, but each other's. We are, brother, we are our brother's keepers. Uh, that's interesting he said that now because I, I, I made the point at the end of our last discussion when he was talking about the Bride of Christ and, and weaving this uh, this gown, this what was it called the gown or the, the wedding dress? The wedding, right. Um, that, um, uh, that I said, we don't each in, get an individual wedding dress, I don't think, because we're not individually married to Christ. It's, it's the body of Christ that's married to him, uh, and now he makes this point. So I think that, that was a, an important distinction to make so that we all understand that, no, the Bride of Christ is the corporate uh, bride, not individually. Each one of us is the bride. Yeah, you know, it's funny. The what he mentions here is a great a great point. We kind of touched on this in the past before. Um, you see, it, it's a direct opposite of what our culture is doing. You know, the more we move, and, and I know we both believe in this, and, and I know a lot of other Christians believe in this. We're moving rapidly in the end time scenario. You know, we're we're definitely moving towards that time, and it certainly pick, looks like that from on the scene. And, you know, looking at history and looking at things develop, but. You see the exact opposite idea of what the world continually builds on. The world, and I notice this just in my everyday, you know, everyday business at work, whether I, when I go out, the world is becoming a, new, a more divided culture. And you know, the more we do with technology, people are less and less personal. They're more and more private. They become hermit-like more. They stay to their own. They they don't. They they become more divided the further we go. And that's not what God teaches at all. You know, He teaches a unity. He, te he teaches a, uh, uh, you know, a, t a togetherness, a oneness of the body of believers. And you can see how Satan, being a great divider that he is, that's exactly what he's trying to do. And it, it gives him great success in the world when people are so divided, when they're so separated. And to retreat to these, um, these personalities of um, just not wanting to interact with human beings in general anymore. And I think there's a general air of that happening today. Hmm. 
Yeah, well, you said a lot there. I think you gave me a lot of ideas as you were, you were talking. Uh, uh, and, 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 of course, we are told to be in the world, mm -hmm. but not of the world. Right. And, and, and he says, let your light shine. Don't put it underneath a table, but put it on top of the table where the light can shine and everybody can see the light. Right. So we are, we are told to go out and be part of the world, uh, it doesn't mean that we have to engage in all the worldly things that uh, mm -hmm. we, we know are wrong, uh, but it does mean that we need to be uh, out there shining the light of Jesus Christ so that they, they can uh, learn about Jesus. Uh, now, also, when you talk about unity, uh, I'm all for unity uh, within the body of Christ with the true body of Christ. And the true body of Christ are those people who put all their faith in Christ and nothing in themselves. Mm -hmm. But those people who are saying that faith in Jesus is not enough for your salvation, but and then they add a list of things that you must do personally so you can qualify somehow through bat water baptism or or uh, speaking in tongues or uh, repenting right. of your sins or or doing very variety of good works, uh, um, giving up all your vices. The list goes on and on that, 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 that people have of things that you must do individually because faith in Christ is not enough. They don't believe that Jesus is enough to save you. You've got to do your part. Well, those people I don't believe are in the body of Christ. And I right. think that there's a, a big problem in Christendom today in that, that uh, a lot of people want to uh, push for this ecumenical, ecumenicalism, which right. is they want all denominations, in fact, not only all denominations of Christianity, but all religions of the world right. to come together right. and have peace and unity together. But uh, I'm and not I guess, for, for that. Well, no, no. And, and, and let me clarify a little bit. When I, when I speak of unity in the body of Christ, I'm, I'm only speaking, of course, of true believers, the true body of Christ. I'm not, I'm not talking about you know, anybody who claims to be a Christian. You know, that, that's not what I mean. What I mean is I'm talking about um, you can see how the, the worldly people, more secular people are. And even, well, for that matter, even some people who claim to be Christians today um, – as we go further and further in history, history people become more reclusive. They, they're they're more separated. They're not. I mean, just just on a scale of being, uh, being human interaction, one person to another. Um, don't you find that in the world today, people are, they're they're becoming very distant. It's like when and then when they get around people, they're very yeah. rude. They're very obnoxious. They're very. I mean, I, I go I go out my door these days. I just go out to the mall or go to some store, and it's it's funny how people act with each other. I mean, it's so there's just absolutely no compassion for people anymore. It seems like it's like I don't know. I don't know how um, universally that true is around the world or even in this country from city to city. Uh, if if it if it's much of a difference, uh, I found that. Uh, tell you a story about the workplace. When, when I used to be employed before I retired, uh, I found that uh, most of the people I was doing, uh, the clientele of the business, uh, I just didn't like them. I thought they were just rude, nasty, very unlikable. And, and it's just, I, I thought, at one point I thought, it seemed like half these customers are jerks. <laughs> and then a year later I'm thinking, it seemed like 90% of them are jerks. <laughs> And then one day I got a revelation, and the revelation was, no, Luke, you're the jerk. <laughs> I, 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 I realized that, that I was, because of my bad attitude, that I was getting reaping what I was sowing. I was putting off a bad attitude, and therefore everybody was being a jerk to me because I was a jerk to them first. Yeah. And once, once I realized that truth, and I changed my attitude, and the first, my first contact with them was always loving and kind, then I hardly ever met another jerk. <laughs> and I found that to be true now, not in the, only in the workplace, but also just in my everyday life and in all my interactions in this world, I, I'm finding that most people are nice and friendly and, and uh, um, not like that if I make that first effort. But if I am, if I'm going to be like an individual, and I'm not going to try to be friendly, you know, if you want to have friends, you've got to be friendly. Right. That's true. No, it's true. And, and and you know, when you do run into that all the time, self evaluation is always a good idea, and you, you definitely should always look at yourself. But I think God would want you to do that. He wants you to look inside yourself first. Um, I guess what I'm referring to is more. It's not so much that. It's just looking at other people interact with each other. 
um, just in how they drive when they go to purchase right. things when they go it's it's a general just um I don't know I, I, at least I've seen it here maybe not so much like you said maybe maybe regionally or some areas it's a little different man <laughs> but yeah. in the, where I live where I live people are extremely rude lately I I just it's it's been very out of the norm rudeness. It's just, yeah. I'm, it's it's not, and it's not so much rudeness. It's um, like I said, it's it's this general feeling of me, I. It's all about me, and I'm not really worried about if anybody else is happy or pleased or you know. It's just a general kind of feeling like that. Yeah, I do think that your 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 premise probably is generally true, but I think it can be uh, dealt with. And 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 it's dealt with the way that I just gave my example is oh, that, absolutely. Uh, uh, if we if we um, Bruce Lee had a style of martial arts Jeet Kune Do and it translates to the way of the intercepting fist. Mm -hmm. You intercept it. In other words, you get there first. And and the idea is before someone has a chance to have this unfriendly attitude to you, you you are first to be friendly. And when you do that, you find out that they're they're kind of disarmed and and they end up. The friendliness that's hidden deep inside them actually comes out, <laughs> and, and and that definitely is the case. And I can tell you firsthand, yes, that definitely works. It definitely works for anybody out there who who feels like they're going through that in the world. You know, that that's a great point you're making. And this again talks about unity and what we should be trying to achieve as true believers. As true believers, you know, we should be trying to draw draw that love out of individuals. And when you see situations like that. We're the peacemakers, and that's that's what Christ means by us being the peacemakers. You know, try to draw that out of people. You should be trying to draw the love out of other individuals, and that's going to make them want to be more, you know, more in tune like we are with Christ. It's 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 gonna it's gonna make them want that more, and it's kind of contagious. It kind of it takes off a little bit from there. You find it it's absolutely true. It's true. It is. Uh, you do run a risk if you if you smile at a stranger, and you give them a friendly greeting. Uh, more times than not, it'll soften their heart and they'll respond in, in kind. But once in a while, you're going to meet the person that is really offended, even that you smiled at them. So, oh, so yeah. you've got to be prepared that you're going to be like, uh, um, you're not going to receive it. You're not gonna, they're not going to receive your invitation of, of friendly invitation yes. very well. That's true. Okay. Uh, I forgot where we were. Let me see. Um, we are our brother's keeper. Uh, the fact that countless professing Christians are not part of a local church testifies to our over-individualized spirituality. Scripture teaches that we need each other and should not withdraw from each other's fellowship, instruction, or accountability. It's unbiblical to imagine that we can successfully seek God on our own. Uh, Hebrews 10.25. Could you look that up? Sure. Uh, because we will be part of a community of saints that constitutes the bride of Christ for eternity, and because we will worship and serve him together to prepare properly for heaven, we must be part of a church now. Okay, so the Hebrews, the Hebrews 10.25 reference says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. And I think there's a, an interesting point to make here because I understand what Randy is saying. Sometimes applying that can be difficult in in the times we're living in right now. It can be very difficult for people to find a, a true a true and good church. So, but that's not to say I think what Christians do is they kind of say, well, they'll retract from that and then simply do nothing. And that's a bad idea too. You should always seek out fellowship. There are reasons. There are reasons the Christians out there avoid some local churches or as I say you know organized churches because they see a lot of bad things going on in them um, but at the same time um, there's always other ways to fellowship you know like we do here I mean you, you need to find true brothers and sisters and fellowship with them because um, when you try and go it alone it, uh, it really is it's tough because you need the support of your brothers and sisters your true brothers and sisters in Christ yeah uh, would you read the verse again Sure, the verse says, it's uh, Hebrews 10, verse 25, and it says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. Okay, uh, so, so we don't want to neglect uh, coming together in groups of, right. of believers. Right. Now, uh, I just, since last uh, Sunday's show, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I made two video, short videos 
based upon the conversations, I thought I wanted to make a couple of points, and, and, and one was a poll question. I asked, well, what, describe what you think is the ideal church. Mm -hmm. We got some interesting feedback from that uh, in terms of, I said, what size of church, what kind of uh, procedures should there be in place in the church, uh, you know, and what type of worship, and so on. Uh, but I think one thing that people need to understand is that uh, the church is not limited to well, the, the traditional, uh, particularly in this country, in this time, what people think of going to church. Uh, right. Anytime people come together, uh, I know that some people say that uh, wherever two or three gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. uh, some people will argue that that is not applicable to the subject that, that is talking about uh, is talking about uh, judging someone brought before the church, uh, if you look at it in context. But I do think that it doesn't matter how many. If, if you have even a, a few people and they're coming together to study the Bible, to worship Jesus, to pray together, and so on, that is that satisfies this Hebrews 10.25. Uh, Absolutely, because there are many places in the world where people are so um, restricted that they have no other recourse but to come together in that fashion. They have to find small groups of Christians and basically have underground churches because uh, they're literally hunted down and killed for their faith. So um, w would people say that those people who do that, if they can only get three or four of them together, that they're not a church? Of course not. They absolutely are part of the church. They're abs absolutely brothers um, assembling themselves together in, in, in the situation that they're in. Yes. And I think uh, even right now at this very moment, we, we qualify for that. We're not together in my house or your house, but we're together because of this technology. It allows us to, to have this communion together Absolutely. And, 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 and study and, and, and praise our Savior. And uh, this, I think this qualifies even with just, just two. Absolutely. Uh, I, I've met over the last, say, seven years on YouTube, a lot of people who are disgruntled over local churches. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm one of them. It's Me hard too. to find one that is, is the doctrinally sound. Uh, and and uh, uh, there are a lot of people, particularly in smaller places, off that, that they don't have a lot of churches from which to choose. And then what they do is they f try to find some other way. And some of them have used the internet as a way of satisfying this and having some fellowship and Bible study together. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, um, now it says, No rivalry between Christ and heaven. A man said to a few of us at a gathering, quote, I find myself longing for heaven, unquote. After he left, someone said to me, quote, Shouldn't he be longing for God, not heaven, unquote? This may sound spiritual, but is it? Scripture speaks positively of, quote, longing for a better country, unquote. That's Hebrews 11.16. I don't know the man's heart, but his statement was biblically warranted. The right kind of longing for heaven is a longing for God, and longing for God is longing for heaven. If we understand what heaven is, God's dwelling place, and who God is, we will see no conflict between the two. A woman who longs to be unite, reunited with her husband could well say, I just want to go home. Uh, I had a conversation with my wife uh, this week about a movie that she wants to go see. It's about one of these near-death near experiences, and they went to heaven. And I said, this, the sad thing is, uh, uh, I don't know of any of these cases where they say they went to heaven, they came back, and they told me what I want to hear uh, as far as what the Bible says. They don't usually talk about Jesus, God. They don't talk about uh, you know the, the beauty and one, the wonders of, of being with God in heaven. Instead, they talk about uh, the five, the book, the five people you meet in heaven. None of them mm -hmm. are Christ, <laughs> uh, or, or or seeing their fam their family and friends. But there's no mention of God, and and uh, and and. and, and, and and sometimes they come back teaching that uh, there's a, a message they bring back, and that is to do something to, to, so that you can go to heaven. You've got to like do something good. And, of course, we know that's the false message. No one gets saved because they do good things. We get saved because of the good thing Jesus did. He died for our sins. So uh, 
uh, yeah, if, if, if people have these near-death experiences and, and they say they went to heaven and they come back, I, I test them uh, by, uh, hey, are they telling me what the scriptures tell us in mm -hmm. terms of doctrine and why aren't they telling us all about seeing Jesus there? Right. That's the same thing I measure that with. And likewise, the same thing for the false ideas of these experiences that um, that talk about hell. Uh, I found the same thing there. When people talk about a hell, it's like Dante's Inferno type of thing where uh, demons sort of run the place and they have fun torturing people. Uh, shows me that the person has a basic misunderstanding of hell because no one runs hell. Hell is a place of torment for everyone who is in it. So it is not um, it's not some place where demons have fun and then people don't. It's it's not like that. Um, no, demons don't want to be there either. Um, it's a tormenting place for them as well. Uh, so, it, but yes, you're right. I mean, it, it's you know the, the the one that's very telling, like you said, is the five people you meet when you go to heaven. And nobody said anything about Jesus. I find myself doing the same thing. I always find myself a little leery of those stories because I want to see what they have to say about the Lord. And of course, when I hear what they say, I go right back to the Bible and say, well, does this go along with what Scripture? really says about heaven and most of the time I'd say I'd say in the 90% range I, I, I could honestly look at these experiences and go nah I'm finding gaping holes in what this person is saying it just doesn't go yeah. along with what scripture says yeah uh, now in the scriptures we do have two stories of these like a near-death experiences where people went to up to heaven we have the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John that right. got to go up and see heaven and they come back and of course they're uh, their message is it's all about Jesus, but Paul says there are things he saw up there that he can't tell us about. <laughs> right, yeah, right. I'm very curious about that part. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm often asked the, qu the following question in various ways. Why talk about heaven when we can just talk about Jesus? The answer is that the two go together. We were made for a person, Jesus Christ, and a place, heaven. There is no rivalry between Christ and heaven. Yeah, it seems like some people, they err both ways. Uh, I made this point about in another video last week about uh, uh, how people err by uh, overemphasizing the red letters in, in the Bible, the words of Jesus. They think those are the only words that, in the Bible that matters. <laughs> And other people err the other way, saying, no, the red letters aren't even to us. Those are just to Jews. The, what, what we need to focus on is Paul's letters alone. And they go to these extremes. And this is another example of someone just going to some extreme, saying, no, let's not talk about heaven. Let's only talk about Jesus. Or let's talk, talk about heaven and leave Jesus out. <laughs> Yeah, go together. No, it's they do, and it's like it's sometimes I wonder if people make these statements just just because they feel like they're giving lip service to God. It's like they're it's almost like they they're they feel the need to one up a person because of what they said. You know, the the person didn't mean anything. Uh, you know. Um, insulting to God by saying I want to go to heaven. It's, it's a natural thing that as a believer I say of course I want to go home. I want to go to heaven. Just because I didn't say I want to see God, I want to go to heaven doesn't mean I want to go there because wherever God is, that's where heaven is. That's where, you know, so it's a, it's a foregone conclusion that I mean that, that I want to see God, I want to be in his presence. It, it's understood to me in my mind, he's all part of the equation. The two, are, the two go hand in hand. Yes. Well, I know if you said that I would get it. But there's a lot of people talk about if they want to go to heaven, but it's like those people that go to heaven, but there's no reference to God in heaven. Well, that's true. You know, it's true. You, you almost want to ask them, and <clears throat> I've, I've made that same similar statement. It's like, well, what, what heaven are you referring to? Like, what's your idea of heaven, you know? Because like you said, these other stories come out, these movies and things of that nature try and show a, a type of heaven that simply isn't biblical, and it leaves yeah. God out. It's a, and, you know. And you, you find out that this uh, universalism is... is is very very prominent. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Most people. I even just saw a video about uh, President George Bush, the younger one, mm -hmm. and he's in the interview. They're asking him about, well, what about Muslims and, and Jews? Are they going to go to heaven too? And he said, he said, oh yes, they're just just a different route to get there. And it's uh, here he is says he's a born again Christian. And, and yet he doesn't understand the most fundamental thing that Jesus says there's only one way. All other yeah, ways are excluded. I remember, I remember that, that conversation with him the day it happened, and I'm sitting there going, I remember that day. I sat there going, George, no, no, George. 
you know, here here you have these guys in positions of power and positions of authority to to really use their this is an opportunity, you know. And I see all these wasted opportunities by these guys, or whether they're just ignorant of the fact that this is what they really, like you said, universalism is, universalism is very prominent. So it's it's generally become something, that's become a really popular catchphrase. There are many ways to heaven. There are many roads to God. No, that that by definition is the road to hell. That's the definition of the road to hell. You know, wide way, many roads. That that That's the definition of hell. Yeah, and, and a lot of people think that not only are there many ways, but always, in, in, in other words, like all roads lead yes. to Rome, always all roads lead to heaven. Everybody gets to go to heaven, and then but some people draw a line and say, well, Hitler doesn't get to go. There's a few really, really, really bad <laughs> right. people. They don't get to go. You know, it's <laughs> that's uh, it's really sad that that is really the probably the predominant uh, uh, viewpoint. Uh, at least as I see in this country. Yeah. Okay. Um, any bride in love with her husband wants to be with him more than anything. But if he goes away to build a beautiful place for her, won't she get excited about it? Won't she think and talk about that place? Of course. Moreover, he wants her to. If he tells her, I'm going to prepare a place for you, he's implying, I want you to look forward to it. Her love and longing for the place he's preparing where she will live with him is inseparable from her love and longing for her husband. Yeah, Brandy beat me to it. That's the line I was going to go to. I was going to say, you know, why would Jesus tell us, hey, I'm going to go prepare this place for you? To turn around and say, but I don't want you to worry about this place and don't even think about this place because, you know, <laughs> why would he do that at all? It doesn't make any sense. You know, he's telling us to be excited for this place he's preparing. Why? Because he's the one who prepared it. And nobody can prepare a place like Jesus can. So, you know, he wants us to, of course he wants us to be excited about this place. Yeah. Well, I've always been excited about it. And and uh, as I read this book, uh, like, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago or something, and, and uh, I got even more excited about it. I read uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman's commentary on uh, the book of Revelation, and uh, when he was talking about heaven in, in there, uh, I got me really excited about heaven. And now as we're going through this again, I'm, I'm again, really excited. So uh, it really... It really does my soul so much good to have my mind on this, on these things. This being with my Savior, being in this place where he, I know he's preparing a wonderful place for me, and you too. Yeah, we're, ne we're never at a loss for negative things in this life right now. There's many negative things to look at, and we really need the things that are going to hold us up and build us up, and this is one of those things. Yeah. Hey, brother, you think maybe that we'll have like uh, be next door neighbors in heaven? That's an interesting. I don't know. I've never even thought of that before. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I would put in a request for that. <laughs> I don't. Well, if you got good neighbors, I guess you. <laughs> you want to be your neighbor. <laughs> I mean, if you got bad neighbors, I don't know. I, mean, I, I got pretty good neighbors. I got nice neighbors. So I, yeah, I'd like to be next to them. That would be bad. <laughs> Some erroneously assume that the wonders, beauties, adventures, and marvelous relationships of heaven must somehow be in competition with the one who created them. God has no fear that we'll get too excited about heaven. After all, the wonders of heaven aren't our idea, they're his. There's no dichotomy between anticipating the joys of heaven and finding our joy in Christ. It's all part of the same package. The wonders of the new heavens and new earth will be a primary means by which God reveals himself and his love to us. Yeah. Uh, picture Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Eve says to Adam, Isn't this place magnificent? The sun feels wonderful on my face. The blue sky is gorgeous. These animals are a delight. Try the mango. It's delicious. Can you imagine Adam responding, your focus is all wrong, Eve. You shouldn't think about beauty, refreshment, and mouth-watering fruit. All you should think about is God. 
<laughs> and you see, but you know what? This is, it's funny we laugh about it, but you know, we, we really, in a way, we deal with this every day. Isn't this just another further thing from the people who believe that we're not even going to go to heaven unless we, unless we live our life on a rail? It's a satanic thing to really take any kind of joy that you have away. Because God knows, and Satan knows too, that your thoughts aren't going to be on God every second of every day. You have other things to do, and God doesn't expect you to do that. That's why there's work. That's why there's play. That's why there's all kinds of things in a human existence, in a human experience, to go through life. He's constantly with us always, and he's constantly in our thoughts. But everything we do isn't about God. When I go to work every day, it's not, a, it's not about God. I don't... What about all those people that don't have jobs that, that involve church or don't involve uh, a script? You know, I go to work some other place. Does that mean I'm not a good Christian because my job isn't about God? Or if I read a book or go see a movie or watch some TV, it's not about God. I'm bad because it's not every single thing I do is Wait not about a second. God. You still have a TV? You haven't you haven't <laughs> destroyed your TV yet? <laughs> I'm working on it, actually. I've, it's funny you said that. I'm thinking about it. After today, I was thinking about shooting my TV, but no, I, no, I, no, I mean, but, but it is. It's another further thing where it's like, and, and that's something Satan does to beat you down. He constantly wants you in this state of you're not good enough, you haven't lived up to an expectation, because it stunts a Christian. It, it, it keeps them stuck in a rut because you – because – he knows you can't live up to that expectation. You're not going to live up to that expectation. Mm -hmm. And it's just another one of those further things. If you think of anything, and, and you know you're going to, if you think of anything that's not God, you know, oh, you got to feel, you should feel terrible about yourself. You're not worthy. You're not worthy to come into prison. You're not worthy to go to heaven. You're not worthy. It's, it's all ultimately coming to the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think I'd better... Uh, make a comment about television since I, I because of that statement I made. It's kind of an want, inside thing. I'm not sure if you really clarified. Yeah, that. I, I don't. I don't want anybody watching to get the impression that I, I'm uh, preaching or teaching against people owning or watching television. I know that. I know that some people like I uh, respect uh, do think that television is evil and you should get rid of your television set. I, I'm. I don't uh, agree with that. Uh, I think that. Television and and the computer and all kinds of technologies that we have uh, are are worthwhile uh, as long as we we use it responsibly uh, and that uh, life is uh, is just like this example uh, our 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 mind is not it's not it's not a requirement that our mind is constantly on God we can have some time where we're thinking about golf or television or or uh, having a, a beer or, or uh, all kinds of other things where we're just visiting with people and we're talking about something else uh, however uh, my favorite topic and I know yours too are, are the scriptures and, and Jesus and when we find people that have that common interest then it's it's a great pleasure but a lot of people we meet in the world that's not their common interest and you end up talking about something else or doing some of the kind of activity so mm -hmm. now I, if you're watching this I'm not I'm not telling anybody that uh, owning a television system is right or wrong. You'll have to make that decision for yourself. Okay. Uh, Adam would never say that because in thinking about these things, Eve would be thinking about God. Likewise, our enjoyment of what God has provided us should be inseparable from worshiping, glorifying, and appreciating Him. God is honored by our thankfulness, gratitude, and enjoyment of Him. I've heard it said that God, not heaven, is our inheritance. Well, God is our inheritance. Uh, see Psalm 16, 6. But so is heaven in 1 Peter 1, verse 3 and 4. God and heaven, the person and the place, are so closely connected that they're sometimes referred to interchangeably. The prodigal son confessed, quote, I have sinned against heaven, unquote. And that's Luke chapter 15. John the Baptist said, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. Why didn't he say God instead of heaven? Because God has made himself that closely identified with heaven. It's his place, and that's his idea, not ours. He could have offered us his person without his place, but he didn't. That's a very interesting point he's making there. You know, I think there's a real – there's a simple way of looking at this that just came to me. You know, if you want to go to a great 
uh, restaurant. You know, you go there because the chef at that restaurant is a wonderful chef. You go there for the chef. The food doesn't prepare itself. The chef prepares the food. Okay, so you go to the restaurant because that chef is a really good chef. Now, would you go to that restaurant and say, "Well, I just came for the chef. I don't need any of his food. I just came here for the chef." Well, no, it's the same type of thing. It's it's almost disrespectful. You know, you'd come there for the chef and not eat any of his food. You know, God has prepared all these things for us to enjoy. It's almost insulting to insinuate that we shouldn't enjoy them. Uh, he he gave them to us to enjoy. Um, to simply say, no, God, you're just enough. I don't want to enjoy any of the stuff you gave me. Um, it's almost insulting because he said, well, I was kind of wasteful. I have all this stuff I've prepared for you. I want you to enjoy it. Um, I don't know. I think it's a pretty simple way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I suspect that uh, there may be people who watch this segment and, and, and may real object to this idea that Randy is stating here that the word God in heaven can be used interchangeably. Uh, there's a There's these... This term in scripture called the kingdom of God and another one called the kingdom of heaven. And there's a big argument uh, of whether these are interchangeable terms or whether they mean two different things. Uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman uh, wrote a book specifically declaring that they're two different things. And then there's other people I've studied. As a matter of fact, the vast majority, that, the majority doesn't mean it's right just because the vast majority agree with this. Because <laughs> the vast majority, no, are, the vast majority are wrong in theology so, as a whole. So therefore, I, I'm not going with majority rule. Right. Many people do think that uh, these, uh, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are interchangeable terms. And now he's saying, given at least examples, saying that. Uh, 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 a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. And obviously, people would say, well, heaven doesn't give you anything. It's God that gives it to him. And, and, uh, and, the, king, and the prodigal son, he says, uh, I have sinned against heaven. Well, did he really sin against heaven or did he sin against God? And yet it says heaven. So uh, uh, in that way, the, the words uh, are basic, are probably used interchangeably. You know, I don't think he means heaven itself he sinned against. He sinned about... God who is in heaven. Right, exactly. He's talking about everything heaven encompasses. It's it's not just you got to remember he heaven is is God's dwelling place. It's a source of all good. It's the source of where everything good comes from, which is God. Um, and so that that was simply a, a way of wording that. It, it's um it's like the like the idea of the four corners of the universe. We talk about the I mean the four corners of the earth. The earth doesn't literally have four corners. That was a figure of speech. It's it's you know, people would say, "Oh, see, you see that statement. It means they believe in a flat Earth." No, it doesn't. I mean, the four corners, the four corners of the Earth is north, south, east, west. The most, the most direct directions, the four corners of the Earth. It's just a saying. It means it means to the ends of the Earth, to the you know, as far as you can go. So it's, I think, in those instances, what he's talking about there is, I'm sitting against heaven. It, it's a, it's simply a figure of speech. He's using a figure of speech to say he sinned against God. He sinned against all that is heavenly, all that is righteous. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so thinking about heaven shouldn't be viewed as an obstacle to knowing God, but as a means of knowing him. The infinite God reveals himself to us in tangible, finite expressions. Next to the incarnate Christ, heaven will tell us more about God than anything else. Some people have told me, I just want to be with Jesus. I don't care if uh, if heaven's a shack. Well, Jesus cares. He <laughs> wants us to anticipate heaven and enjoy the magnificence of it, not to say, I don't care about it, or I'd be just as, uh, just as happy in a shack. When you go to visit your parents in the house you grew up in, it's no instant insult to tell them, I love this place. It's, it's, uh, it's a compliment. They'll delight in it, not resent it. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this line in Scripture before, but, you know, that's where, where Jesus, you know, it says, you know, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He makes a point of that. Well, why would he want us to store up treasures in heaven if he didn't want us to think about those treasures in heaven? Yeah. He, he never says, just think about me in heaven, and it should be enough for you. That, that He doesn't say that. He, he says, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. The rewards you, we're told about rewards we're going to get in heaven. We're told about this place he's going to make for us. If he didn't want us to be concerned about those things, 
or wonder about those things, he wouldn't have specified those things. He wouldn't have made a point of mentioning those things. Yeah. So why do you think some people will try to act like this is a, a bad thing? To think, you th Don't think about heaven, just think about Jesus instead. Or... Well, I think, in a way, I think it's... um. It's it's almost a, in a way they're almost making you resentful of Jesus. I mean, it's like here he's made all these wonderful things for you, but don't think about them. You're not supposed to think about them. You're just supposed to think about him. And in a, in a way, some of these people are like that's where some of the people come across and say, well, that's kind of boring. I mean, I, Jesus is wonderful and everything, but doesn't that make heaven the boring place that they talked about, where I'm just where we talk about, where you just you're going to go to heaven and just sit there and stare at Jesus for eternity? Well, that, that's that's the concept people start to build in their mind, I think, and and that's where that comes from. And that's not the case, and Jesus doesn't say that. I suspect I can't read people's minds. I don't know their heart, but I suspect that some of these people, their real reason for making that kind of a statement would be that they are these uh, lordship work salvationist mindset, where they want to make it come off as they are so pious. And they, that's what I meant by the they, that's what I meant by the lip service. That thank you put it much better than I did. That that's what I meant. They want they they want to look uh, more pious than they are by saying, "Well, I'm going to one up you by saying that you like heaven." No, no, it's all always just got to be Jesus. It's it's you know yes, I agree with that. I think you're right. <laughs> okay, um, every thought of heaven should be should move our hearts toward God. Just as every thought of God will move our hearts toward heaven. And that's why Paul could tell us to set our hearts on heaven. Not just set your hearts on God. To do one is to do the other. Heaven will not be an idol that competes with God, but a lens by which we see God. Hmm. Now, now, you know, real quick, I want to interject something real quick because you know somebody is just lying, waiting in the wings to look at this video and and uh, take a little clip out of it and say, oh, that Luke and that Eric, look, they're telling you don't think about Jesus. And they're going to ignore the rest of the conversation that we're having, the fact that, that that's all what we're talking about, and they're going to say, look, see, they're telling you. You don't need to think about Jesus <laughs> because you laugh, but you know somebody's out there thinking that right now. They're writing it down. Oh, I gotta get this. I gotta get this clip. So please, everybody, read the whole, watch the whole video because we'll tell you about Jesus. And you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've had people not only take uh, a statement I make uh, out of context uh, and, and make a video and just showing that one statement. I've had people actually take a half a statement. <laughs> They well, sometimes even, they got to it. It's like and you, half of a statement and not even let me finish the full sentence before the, to 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 show the, any kind of context at all. That's how deceptive and dishonest some of these people are. Absolutely. Uh, if we think unworthy thoughts of heaven, we think unworthy thoughts of God. That's why the conventional caricatures of heaven do a terrible disservice to God, and adversely affect. Our relationship with him if we come to love heaven more the heaven God portrays in Scripture we will in inevitably love God more if heaven fills our hearts and minds God will fill our hearts and minds those who love God should think more often of heaven not less yeah I found that to be true and every time uh, I've studied heaven uh, that's been the result for me. The, the, uh, by, by thinking of, of God, it makes me think of his promise of my future in heaven. By Absolutely. thinking of heaven, it makes me grateful to, to, to our, my Savior who, who made that possible for me. Yeah, it always leads you back to the source. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll move on to chapter 20 now. And I'm... Uh, Skipping apart, the title here is Jesus Worthy King of the New Earth. Uh, Revelation chapter 5 says, depicts a powerful scene in the present heaven. God the Father, the ruler of heaven, sits on the throne with a sealed scroll in his right hand. What's sealed uh, with seven seals to avoid any possibility that the document has been tampered with is the Father's will, 
his plan for the distribution and management of his estate. In this case, the entitlement of the estate is the earth, which includes its people. God had intended for the world to be ruled by humans, uh, but who will come forward to open the document and receive the inheritance? I forgot to read the title. Uh, the title of chapter 20, I, the title is important in his book because it, it's always a question. And the question he asks, beginning chapter 20 is, what does God's eternal kingdom involve? So there's uh, this seal. I, I hadn't really thought about that uh, until I read this book about these seals being opened, how Randy refers to it as uh, the, it's God's will, uh, his plan for distribution and management of his estate. Uh, I'd have to read those verses on the seal and on the opening of the seal. Maybe he'll go into more detail uh, as we go forward here. What's your reaction to that? Do you ever think of it in that, in that way before? That's a, that's an interesting take on. I hadn't thought of it exactly that way, a similar way. Um, but it you know it shows the authority. Well, and the reason why I definitely do think of it that way when you read the next line that he's got in the book, what John writes, what he says after that. Okay. So, let me, let me yeah, go ahead and read John's quote. It says John writes quote. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. See, Revel Revelation 5, verse 4. Yeah, so he, he intended for that, you know, the estate to be under our control, but humans, of course, you know, man let sin enter the world, and by default we, we gave up the right to be able to, to, to rule that estate and determine what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he goes on to say, because of human sin, mankind and the earth have been corrupted. No man is worthy to take the role God intended for Adam and his descendants. Adam proved unworthy, as did Abraham, David, and every other person in history. But right when it appears that God's design for mankind and the earth will forever be thwarted, the text continues in high drama. Quote, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased uh, men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. What a beautiful scene that is. That is. That's one of that's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. And you get so many you get so many aspects right in that one that one little part the aspects of the of Christ, you know, wrapped up in that one little description of everything of who he is. When it, they, they, it, he starts rattling off the different the lion the, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of Jesse um, the lamb that is uh, that is uh, looked at if had been slain. It's all, all these things. You look at all these pictures and people say, well, you know, Jesus is the lamb. He's the lion. He's the root of David. He's the, you know, this. You can't be talking about anyone else. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Every finite being, angelic and human, stands in amazement at this man and what he has done. The Father who sits on heaven's throne will never die. Instead, the heir, the beloved firstborn son, has died. He was slain that he might purchase men for God. And not just a small representation of fallen humanity, but from every tribe and language and people and nation. The passage culminates with a statement about Christ's followers. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Revelation 5.10 They will reign on earth. Wow. 
it's, it's going to go on, I think, either in this chapter or future chapters about this government and our part in the government. Uh, uh, and not, this is not talking about the millennial reign. This is a talking about in eternity. Uh, and that uh, we will reign as joint heirs with Christ. Psalm 2 speaks of Christ ruling with an iron scepter and dashing the nations to pieces like pottery, a reference to the Messiah's return, judgment, and perhaps his millennial reign. But once we enter the new heavens and new earth, there's no iron rule or dashing to pieces, for there's no more rebellion, sin, or death. The vanquishing of sin doesn't mean the end of Christ's rule. It means the end of his contested rule and the beginning of his eternally uncontested rule when he will delegate earthly rule to his co-heirs. If we understood God's unaltered plan for his people to exercise dominion over the earth, it wouldn't surprise us to find on the new earth that nations still exist and kings come into the new Jerusalem bringing tribute to the king of kings. Revelation chapter 21. It's going to be very, very interesting to see how it all plays out. I mean, I don't want to have any envy, and I don't want to have any uh, great aspirations about my, my place in it all, but I know that I have a place. Uh, I have some position and some role in eternity. Uh, I wonder who these kings will be. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, th I think it's a natural thing for a Christian, uh, you know, a person who who's a true Christian, you know, to try to have as much humility as a human being as you can. And, you know, part of that is like you said, you know, I think of this and I think, I think to myself, knowing me the way I know me, you know, I look at myself and go, how can I rule over something? Why would he want me to rule over something? Why would I be a, possibly be a king or would I ever be, you know? And what it does to me, more, more than make me, it's funny, to the Christian, for me it makes me feel more humility to say, wow, that God would know me as personally as he knows me, and still after all I've done, what Christ has done is so special that he holds none of that against me, that it's all been taken away from me, and he's ready to bless me in such a way that I can't even fathom. That it's a very humbling experience. It's it, it's it's to to know that he loves me that much is um, words don't really have a description for it. it. It makes you it makes you to me that that's part of the thing. It makes me want to be better, you know, as a Christian. It makes me want to feel like at least have some feeling that I've um, you know, deserve in some way this great gift he's going to give me of, of rule or whatever. You know, it's like I want to talk myself into believing that I've done something that to help. You know, yeah. <laughs> even though Christ has done all the work. You know, um, you, you still you still to be pleased. But you want to try. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, I've I've kind of changed my mind over the years, back and forth in terms of uh, these uh, the bema seat. You know, when we we get our mm -hmm. Our, our works are judged for our rewards, and, and uh, they will be put in the fire. And some may I may have some gold, silver, precious gems. I may have some crowns, and I may have some burned up like wood, hay, and stubble that God valued, put no value on what I did. Uh, and, and I used to think that, well, even the poorest person in heaven is going to be so happy, uh, but but. I kind of go back and forth about how much should we focus on building up these treasures. We're actually told to, to labor for them, mm -hmm. and it's not. I don't think it's a bad thing to be ambitious in that way, and sure. in your mind to be on those things, trying to run that race and and, uh, and and get those treasures. Jesus said to do it. Paul said to do it, and uh, some people act like even to think about that and be. Um, Ambitious in, in, in that way is somehow uh, somehow uh, they disdain that. Yeah, no, I know what you mean, and again, it comes back to that whole 
I, I should almost feel guilty for feeling that way when God tells me essentially that I should look forward to those things. And I shouldn't feel guilty for that because ultimately I'm doing it not so much for the gift as it is the rewards I've been given based on the fact that I'm pleasing to my father, that I've done things that have pleased my father to the degree that he wants to bl rain blessings upon me and rain rewards down upon me for them. It's more about his, um, his delight in me than it is about the actual thing itself. Because really, what, what is eternity going to be other than a constant state of us wanting to delight the Lord firsthand? You know, we talk about, we, we try to delight him now, but we can't do it on the level that we see him. You know, we, we, we don't have him right here in front of us, you know. But in eternity, we are able to do it on a scale. Through the millennium and eternity, we're able to do it on a scale where we're constantly doing these things to, for, to constantly delight the Lord in, in what we do for him. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, there, there's a lot of confusion in the world uh, over works and salvation, and I think this would be a good point to, to uh, clarify this this point in that uh, salvation and etern salvation means that you're saved from a bad fate. The fate is you die, you, you die, and you fi you're found wanting because you never put your faith in Jesus, and therefore you get put into the lake of fire, the second death, and that's a bad fate. So we, we get saved from that when, uh, when we put our faith in the Savior. Mm -hmm. and, and then we, we also receive eternal life, and so salvation and eternal life is a free gift. It's not based upon works. Uh, it's, a, it's a gift that we don't have to pay for because Jesus paid for it himself. He, he bought this gift for us with his blood on the cross. And, and so he, he, since he paid for it, he can give it to us as a gift. And, and we can we receive it simply because we put our faith completely in him. And that's when we get this. Now that gets our, our place in heaven and it gets us eternal life. But our works, we do not earn this place in heaven because of our works. However, our works do come into play. We earn rewards, these treasures in heaven, and maybe some kind of status or position, a role or responsibility in governing in eternity. Uh, that's based upon our works. So you can work to earn those things, mm -hmm. but you cannot work to earn salvation because right. salvation is a free gift. Amen. That's right. Where was I? I think you were on the next part, the importance of land. Was that the next part? or Did I get all the way down there? Uh, I thought it was every finite being. Oh, no, I read that. The passage comments. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. If we understood God's own... Yeah. Uh, the importance. Oh, the importance of land. I, I'm, I scratched that out. I moved okay. on now to... The point where it says the goal of history above that. Okay. Uh, I, I start off with the paragraph. It says uh, the only reason I skip some of this is because it's redundant. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, God gave management of the earth to Adam and Eve. All people would be their descendants, taking up their management responsibilities in turn. Then came the fall and the flood. Later, when God made His covenant with Abraham. What did he promise him first? Land. Uh, that's in Genesis 12, verse 1 and 7. Though the whole earth was under the curse, God granted Abraham a piece of land that could be lived on, ruled, and managed in a way that would bring glory to God and blessing to all other lands and nations. Let's look that up anyway. Can you find Genesis 12, sure. verse 1 and 7? See, Genesis 12, um, verse 1 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. And in 12, 7, he says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. Okay. So um, Abraham was promised land. 
And then he says, uh, quote, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3.29. Could you look that up so we can see that in another translation? You said it was Galatians 4.29? Uh, 3.29. 3.29. Galatians 3.29. Oops, I messed up. Hold on one second. There we go. Uh, Galatians 3.29 says, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay. So we see that the promise to Abraham was land, and it says here that those of us who put our faith in Christ, we're heirs to this uh, and, and we get this inheritance that was promised to Abraham, and, and that is land. Mm -hmm. New Covenant Christians, not just Israel, are heirs to the promises made to Abraham. And these promises center on possessing the land. After saying that mankind would rise from the dust of the earth and rule Christ's kingdom on earth, that's a Daniel chapter 12, God promises Daniel you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Uh, inheritance typically involves not just money, but also land, a place lived on and managed by human beings. After our bodily resurrection, we will receive a physical inheritance. I guess it's worth uh, pointing out that... Uh, He says, New Covenant Christians, not just Israel, are heirs of the promises made to Abraham. Uh, there's, a, again, these, these people are, uh, everybody wants to like uh, take, go to extremes in there when they, they read something. And you've got a, a group of people, uh, I think that, uh, what is the name of this uh, ideology? Um, I think you're, are you referring to replacement theology? Yeah, re replacement theology. Uh, this is the, the people who believe that the promises made to Israel are no longer promised to Israel. Instead, they're promised to the church, the body of Christ, all, all Christians. Uh, and then you have other people that that say, no, all the promises to Israel are, are still still to Israel. And you have Randy saying here that that we also have some share in this, uh, and according to at least this, this land inheritance, we, he's proven from those two verses that the inheritance is land, and mm -hmm. uh, we're co-heirs to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's real common for people to just go from one extreme to another. On, on Anything they read in the scriptures, they, it seems like there's somebody who finds a way of making it divisive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and we keep coming back to that, don't we? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, the goal of history. God is the sovereign ruler of the universe, yet he chooses not to rule the universe alone. He delegates responsibilities to angels who exist in a hierarchy of command under Michael the archangel. That's in Jude and also in Revelation. God made human beings in his image as creators and rulers to carry out his divine will. He does not grudgingly pass on to us management responsibilities. On, on the contrary, he delights and to entrust earth's rule to us. He has uniquely created and gifted us to handle such responsibilities and to find joy in them. I'm sure this is a big surprise to many people watching, you know, that this responsibility, this management of being managers. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, most Christians are understand the idea that Adam and Eve were given, given dominion over the earth, right? Mm -hmm. But somehow they think that that, that uh, responsibility, that gift God gave Adam and Eve, Somehow that it's just null and void anymore. But but what we know from scriptures is that we still ha we still have this uh, this gift and, and management responsibility to, to have dominion over the earth, and that will be uh, come into play in eternity, where 
all of us who put our faith in the Savior are part of that managing the earth, having the government over the earth and ruling it. Right. It's it's like anything else in Scripture. For man to to have delegation, have authority over the earth, was God's will. It was his will for that to take place. And there's nothing we can do to eliminate the will of God, but our actions simply put that on hold for a time. That was never never taken to the point where God was going to remove that entirely and it wasn't going to be the case. He wants it to return to that, his original will, which is for us to rule and reign over the earth. We're supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way to look at it because... You're, you're talking about God's will. It wasn't something that accidentally happened or we took upon ourselves. This was something God told mankind, I will this for you. This is what I wish for you to do. Uh -huh. So when you say will, uh, will is, is uh, one, one way of looking at will is a, uh, um, I have the will to do something. I, that's How would you define that? I have the desire, the determination to make something happen. And then another use of the word will is this, like a last will and testament that Randy referred to earlier, that this scrolls were opened, and that's the will. That's the uh, stating that, hey, we, we will get this inheritance. Okay, we're going to go to chapter 21 and pick up where the subtitle says, oh, let me read the title of chapter 21, because I keep forgetting to do that. Title chapter 21, the title is the question, will we actually rule with Christ? Uh, subtitle says, why are we surprised that we'll rule the earth? Well, you know, to answer your question really quick before I interrupt you, to answer your question, I was one of those people. Um, before I became truly saved, um, I didn't know that. I had no clue. I mean, in fact, it, it felt kind of, based on everything wrong I had been taught prior to that, um, I thought this was like a, a, a wrong concept. I, th I thought, huh, we, us rule? And, I mean, it was, it was something that was never, because I, was, I had a very uh, controlled, false religious belief that I was involved in, this was never taught to you. You, know, you, you weren't taught to read the scripture, you know, read all the whole of Scripture and and study it. You weren't told that. So when people brought this idea to me, at first I wanted to kind of reject it because I thought, like you said, I, I tried to be more pious. It's so funny how we were just talking about that and how that happens, but I, I felt like I was being more pious by saying, oh, no, that can't be the case. I, I can't rule. That, no, no, just, just Jesus rules. I, I don't have any rule. And it, you have this natural inclination to do that. Yes. <laughs> So I was one of those people. I felt I thought that too uh, before I was saved. I, I didn't realize that was the case. Yeah, I, I would guess that if not everyone, most everyone starts off with that thought, and and, and only through studying the scriptures and reading this book is opening our eyes to a lot of things uh, that that uh, this our our um, destiny is to be co-heirs and co-rulers mm -hmm. and and uh, yeah I, I, I think that in this case I don't think it necessarily um, uh, denotes that you are uh, or anyone else is being like pious that it's just it's just I probably is probably a national natural assumption until you study scriptures well I think some people feel like somehow it, it I think the fear of fear comes across some people who don't know scripture and they think that in some way you're making yourself equal with Jesus. Yes. And that's an imp it's an important thing to make clear that no, that does not mean we are equal with Christ. We are not equal with him. This is simply something that God has bestowed upon us. He's allowed for us because this was what he wanted to be the case to begin with. Jesus, of course, becomes the king of kings, the lord of lords. He rules over all of creation uh, because, of course, he was the, the lamb who was slain, who was the only one found worthy to open the seal. You know, we messed up as mankind, and we ruined this rule for ourselves. He's simply bringing back the original role God intended for us. And we, of course, are under him. So no, it, it, we are not making ourselves equal with Jesus Christ. We're not. That's, it's, by saying you will rule with him is not saying you're making yourself equal with Christ. And that's the yeah. thing you want to be clear about. Yeah. See, uh, God's original plan uh, was, was that Adam and Eve and the descendants of Adam and Eve would reign over the earth. Right. And uh, this, it was... Um, 
detoured, but his plan is not thwarted, and 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 no, now it can't happen. No, it's still going to happen. It's just that we've been on a detour for a long time, and eventually we will get back to that original plan, and it will be successful. Uh, let me see. Did I read that first paragraph? Did I nope. Mm. Um, okay. Oh, why are we surprised that we're ruling? Actually, I was going to read the paragraph just before that. It says, prior to Christ's return, his kingdom will be intermingled with the world's cultures. Matthew chapter 13, verse 20 through 30. But his followers will be growing in character and proving their readiness to rule. Uh, through adversity and opportunity, as well as in their artistic and cultural accomplishments, they will be groomed for their leadership roles in Christ's eternal kingdom. Their society transforming creative skills will be put on prominent display in the new universe, where they will, quote, shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, unquote, Matthew chapter 13. Could, could you, yeah, could you read, let's... Uh, Matthew, where he has there, Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and then skip up to verse 43. See what those verses say. Hold on one second. And then the other one was 43. Uh-huh. Okay, um, let's see. Matthew uh, chapter 13, 24 through 30 says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst, thou, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then in verse 43 it says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Hmm. I don't know how he makes that conclusion uh, based upon those verses. Uh, it says, Prior to Christ's return, the kingdom will be intermingled with the world's cultures. Okay, now I see, yeah. Uh, prior, prior to his return, okay? But his followers will be growing in character and proving their readiness to rule. Okay, I, I can see that. I don't think the verses necessarily are saying that the followers will be growing in character and proving their readiness to rule. I'm not. You don't get that from those verses, but we know from other scriptures that is the case. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of the, that section of verses there, 24 through 30? Does that apply correctly? Uh, I I think I'm in agreement with you. I'm not so sure that his application there is is to that. I don't think that's – it's not that the application can't be used for that, but the application's more meant to talk about how you know there are going to be false believers, there are going to be growing with believers in a world that's coming up in this way, and rather than reap them all and take away the the you know those who are who are. Uh, who are heirs? Who are who are you know the believers? You know they will allow them for a time to be together, and they're going so they're going to go. And maybe that's where he means the adversity is going to come, and through going through these things of of um, going through life together, intermingled the way we are, we're going to go through adversity. We're going to go through our ability to deal with people. So in a way, I guess you could indirectly get that. Yeah. You know, from that, uh, I, I've always taken these verses here to talk about the. It says the kingdom of heaven, but it's talking about uh, the current state of the world. Right. And that is that in the, within the church, sitting next to you on the pew, 
is someone who's professing uh, uh, their, Christ, their Christian faith, and yet they're uh, they're a wolf in sheep's clothing. They're a, a they're right. a tear, not right. really wheat. They may look like wheat, right. but they're not. It's not the that's real a better thing. Way to, that's a better way to put it, yeah. right? And the real thing is not determined by you know how holy they live their lives. Those are probably more likely to be tear because they're trying so hard to prove themselves. Because, look at me, look what I'm doing and stuff. Right. That would be a tear because their faith is in their own, in themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the, the the proof of who the, the wheat and the tear is, the wheat, those are the people who are confessing, I'm not worthy, but Jesus is my savior. So that's why, that's why I'm, uh, I'm saved, only because of Jesus. And uh, but right next to them on the pew is going to be someone else that's claiming to be a Christian, and yet their faith is not in themselves. They're just a pretender, a, a hypocrite. A, right. a hypocrite. Uh, I like that word. It, it's from the uh, person known as Hippocrates. Mm -hmm. Hippocrates is known as the father of the theater. He was an actor. An actor is a liar. And every time you see someone acting, like in the in the theater or in a movie, they're lying. They're they're not really the character. They're pretending to be somebody who they're not, and therefore that's what the the, the Terry is, the a hypocrite, someone who's pretending to be a Christian but is not really one. Uh, okay. Uh, now it says because I teach on the subject of redeemed humanity ruling the earth. I've had many opportunities to observe people's responses. Often they're surprised to learn that we will reign in eternity over lands, cities, and nations. Many are skeptical. It's a foreign concept that seems fanciful. Nothing demonstrates how far we've distanced ourselves from our biblical calling, like our lack of knowledge about our destiny to rule the earth. Why are we so surprised? when it is spoken of throughout the Old Testament and repeatedly reaffirmed in the New Testament. So that's a question he asks. Why are we so surprised about that? It's, uh, I would say we're surprised uh, because most of the world, first of all, is very ignorant of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And then if you, if you, if you weed out all of the other religions of the world who don't even consider the Bible, uh, and then all those. Then we look, focus on Christendom. All those people who uh, name Jesus, and they say they're Christian, they're Christians, mm -hmm. and yet uh, they're they're not. And we weed out a lot of those because instead of they're putting their faith in Christ, they put their faith in themselves. So now we weed it out more, and now we have it down to the the people who. Put, are relying on Christ for their salvation. How many of those have studied the scriptures thoroughly to understand these things? And what you find that most of those are really quite ignorant of the scriptures. Understanding this basic idea that this promise was made to Adam and Eve and their descendants, and, and God is going to keep that promise, but it is, we inherit that promise. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it's um, they don't educate themselves about the scriptures, and then they go one step further. The things that they don't know about... They simply um, they lean to their own understanding of what they think must be the case by what they think they know about God, rather than actually searching the scriptures. And they kind of think to themselves, "Well, we wouldn't rule Earth and have rule over nations and cities and lands and things because, um, in my idea of heaven, uh, there'd be no need of a hierarchy." However, if you look a little further and you do a little digging, there are other hierarchies where that should fall into place. For instance, the angels. The angels that were faithful to God were always faithful to God, yet there's still a hierarchy among in the angelic realm. We just discussed it. You just talked about it, Michael being the archangel. So God a hierarchy of those under those under those is simply a plan God instituted even before the world began. He even this is something that, that God puts together. He puts together a hierarchy. So um, to assume that there wouldn't be a hierarchy based on just your own understanding would be wrong. It'd be an error because you can demonstrate in Scripture that outside of what we do as sinful people under hierarchy, um, God does have hierarchy uh, in the angels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think he, he is correct first in his um, uh, statement that very few people understand this. No, I, and, I agree. 
and then the question is why do so few people understand this and it's because so few people have really taken the time to study the scriptures to see what they say about these things ultimately yeah because crowns are the primary symbol of ruling every mention of crowns as rewards is a reference to our ruling with Christ in his parables Jesus speaks of our ruling over cities Luke 19 17 um, could you look that up? Sure. Paul addresses the subject of Christians ruling as if it were Theology 101. Okay, Luke 19, chapter 19, verse 17. Yeah. Uh, says, And he said unto them, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, thou have thou authority over ten cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in that parable, someone gets uh, or the earns because of what they did, authority over ten cities, and the, another person gets five cities, and another person gets one city, if I remember correctly. So it's not everybody doesn't have an equal share of this inheritance of land or governing or position. Uh, it's not going to be some kind of like communist state where everybody has an equal share of the pie, everybody in communism basically everybody's equally poor. Yeah, and, and that's it, right, and that's one of those that's like one of those instances where I think people lean to their own understanding because, like you said, they don't study scripture, they lean to their own understanding, and they think that's the natural way that it should be without being educated in scripture. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and, and then he says. Uh, uh, quote, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That's right. Uh, the form of the verb in this question implies that we won't simply judge them a single time, but will continually rule them. Well, uh, that's interesting. I've gotten some strange looks making that comment to Christians who don't study their Bible. I've made that comment, and I've just offhand said, some, some, I'll be in a conversation with a Christian and say to them, well, do you, do you not know that we will judge angels? And they'll go, what? I'm like, you've never read that in Scripture? <laughs> and they said, no, I remember that being in the Bible. <laughs> it's another one of those cases that people don't study. I mean, it's right there. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's saying that that it implies an ongoing judgment or, or over over the angels. That's interesting. Uh, well, first of all, I think we need to clarify for those people who do not study the Bible, which is the vast majority of people, when we use the word saint, it's not uh, as the Roman Catholic Church uses that term. The way the right. Bible uh, defines saint uh, uses the word saint. I'll let you answer that, Eric. Well, the, the Bible simply defines a saint as anyone who's a believer in Christ, anyone who's accepted Christ as their Savior. That's right. So if you if you were to look at a uh, hundred Christians, and, and everybody was to try to like judge them, uh, who's the best Christian, who's the worst Christian, even the worst Christian of the hundred, uh, the Bible says they're a saint because they're a Christian. The word Christian and saint are interchangeable terms; they're synonyms. Uh, so the Roman Catholic Church has taken the word and said that a saint is, is someone uh, in the Roman Catholic Church who is not only a Roman Catholic but has become a super person, a super uh, religious person and done miracles. These only the very elite, the very best of the best could be called saints. But that's not biblical. No. And they have to actually go through a whole process before they canonize them as saints. They actually yeah. have to... <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Uh, it says, if Paul speaks of his future realities as if it were something every child should know, why is it so foreign to Christians today? Elsewhere, he says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. That's 2 Timothy 2.12. God's decree that his servants will reign forever and ever on the new earth, Revelation chapter 22, is a direct fulfillment of the commission he gave to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Unquote. That's Genesis chapter 1. 
Uh, I want to back up for a second how he, when he talks about because crowns are the primary symbol of ruling, every mention of crowns as rewards is a reference to our ruling with Christ. Uh, uh, in the past, I didn't really put that together. I don't know why. It does seem like an obvious thing, doesn't it? A crown is given to a, a king or a, a prince or some kind of a ruler. Absolutely, it's it's an authority. It's a it's a symbol of authority. Yeah, uh, I had just thought of crowns as just like another like a, a symbolic thing for some kind of reward you get, just like you get gold, silver, precious gems, and treasures in heaven and crowns. I thought it was all the same, but the crown is has more of a meaning than just simply reward. It's a it's a title, a status, a a. Uh, um, a position. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to back up one more thing to another comment you said. It's like, um, you know, as, as to you know, why don't Christians know this more? Um, now, do you have you found in your experience that when you've brought that verse up to people, do you know that do you not know that we will judge angels? Have you have you brought that up to Christians and had them look at you like you got two heads and go what? <laughs> yeah. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> well, and 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 the thing is, I have a very simple answer to that. Do you think that Satan may have a problem with that line? <laughs> yeah. I think he's got a I think he's got a pretty big problem with that line, and I'm sure he doesn't want people to know that. Um, yeah. And that'd be my answer as to why most people don't know that line, uh, yeah. because he has a he has a big problem with that. <laughs> well, uh, I think that that you and I are probably likely to use that verse in response to the people saying, "Judge not, lest you be judged." Because they don't want Christians being judgmental, right? And uh, when it comes to judging, uh, that verse uh, uh, is in the part where Jesus is talking about uh, uh, before you judge, uh, the 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 spe try to take a speck out of someone's eye. First, take the plank out of your own eye, then right. you can see clearly. To remove the, the the speck out of your brother's eye, right. and Jesus is talking about hypocrisy. Yes. If if, if somebody is 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 uh, wrong in some way, and then you're trying to tell them they're wrong, and yet you're doing the same thing, you're a hypocrite. First, make sure you're not guilty of the same thing before you try right. to speak about it to someone else. So, uh, the, one of the favorite verses of non Christians is judge not lest he judge judge not because a lot of Christians are trying to judge people and point out their sin because uh, or I shouldn't say Christians but a lot of professing Christians and preachers particularly street preachers I know they're all pointing out people's sins and they're being real judgmental and the, the non-believer says judge not lest you judge uh, be judged and uh, and then the, the street preacher would say uh, well, we're not told not to judge. We're supposed to judge righteously, use righteous judgment, and the Scripture does say that. Yes, so on one hand, the tell, Scripture tells us, yes, you should judge, uh, and uh, but make sure it's a righteous judgment, and make, Jesus says, make sure you're not being a hypocrite when you judge. And, uh, and then this verse even says, uh, we're going to even judge the angels. And, and Paul even said, why do I have to write you this letter? Uh, because... Uh, you can't solve this problem. You can't make a judgment. Don't you know that you're going right. to judge the angels, and yet you can't make a simple judgment within the congregation with this person? Right. It was kind of it was kind of a frustrative statement. It was kind of saying, you know, uh, he was speaking a little bit of his frustration with them, saying, you, you don't yeah. understand these basic things. I mean, you can't make these these judgments amongst yourselves. <clears throat> yeah. So. Um, when it comes to judging, if anybody's watching this now, I believe what the scriptures tells us about judging is that uh, uh, I'm not going to judge whether someone is a, is not a Christian based upon how they're living their life because I know that that's not what determines someone a Christian. Uh, I I'll judge their Christianity whether they're truly a Christian simply upon their their profession of faith. If I ask them, uh, exactly. what are the ground what are the grounds that you're basing your Christianity on? What why why should I consider you to be a Christian? And if they say, well, because I go to church and I do this and I do that, in other words, they're based, they're only talking about right. themselves. Then I right. say, well, you're not a Christian because you're trying to be justified by yourself. A, a really a Christian is someone who's, who says, uh, I don't deserve to be uh, to, uh, to have eternal life. Uh, I'm not worthy. Jesus is my savior. That's the only reason. If they're if they're they're pleading their case based upon Jesus instead of themselves, then that testimony would satisfy me. I'm not going to evaluate their lives 
uh, to determine that. However, I will evaluate their lives to ter determine what's right and wrong based upon what Scripture says. Exactly, words, and I think that's I think that's a per a, a big point to make there because what people want to use in my experience too is you have the unbelievers who want to use that phrase as what I call a spiritual magic bullet, a silver bullet. Um, they think by using the judge not that you have to stop saying anything about sin. And unbelievers who may be watching need to understand that a Christian pointing out that sin is sin is not judging. For instance, if I tell you, you know, looking at pornography and things like that is sin, it's lust, okay? And I look at it myself, I'm not being judgmental, I'm stating it is a sin. I'm not saying I don't do it. It would be wrong for me to tell someone, like Luke said, um, to point a finger at someone and to say, you are not saved. Because I don't have that knowledge. I'm incapable of having that knowledge. All I can go by is, like Luke said, if you make a a confession that Jesus Christ is your Lord and you put your total faith and trust in him, then it is, then I have to accept that you have accepted Christ. I can't be judgmental to the fact to say, and this is what we deal with sometimes with the Lordship crowd, is they're, they, are, they are actually judging. They are judging someone based on their actions, and um, sometimes people fall or fail. And that's where you have to make an important separation. A Christian simply pointing out sin is not judging. That's agreeing with God. That's <laughs> simply God says something sin. I'm agreeing with him. I'm not saying I haven't done it or don't do it. I'm simply saying it is a sin. It's a sin for you, and it's a sin for me. So, you know, it's important to yeah, acknowledge the sin. <clears throat> so as Christians, it's not that we are told not to judge. We are supposed to make judgments based upon what the Scripture says. Uh, and and uh, we, we are not to, to adopt this uh, secular humanist theology of moral relativism. Right. Where, where there's no such thing as right and wrong. It's all, in, all a matter of opinion. What's, what's wrong for one person is not wrong for someone else. No, we, we will not accept that uh, theology because it is right. a theology. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, a doctrine of, mm -hmm. of the, uh, uh, the secular humanist people. Uh, so we have to stand against that and say there is absolute right and wrong. There is black and white. It's not just gray. And, and how do I determine what's right and wrong? It tells me, the scripture tells us what's right and wrong. Right. And, and uh, now, uh, am I telling you, you have to stop doing wrong to get saved? No. You have to trust the Savior to get saved. Now, after you get saved, if you continue doing the wrong things, you're going to suffer some consequences in your life because when you you reap what you sow. If you have bad health habits, you get sick. If you if you lie, cheat, and steal, you go to jail. But it doesn't stop you from going to heaven because that uh, heaven is a gift. We don't work for it. We don't earn it through our personal merit. All right. The matter of fact, someone once said to me, Luke. The only thing that we uh, do more than judging is breathing. <laughs> Every person makes judgments all day long. A judgment is simply a decision. I should I do this or should I do that? Well, I'm judging. I should do this. You know, we're judging right. constantly. Right. To live by the concept of no judging means we should live in anarchy, and I don't think anyone really wants. Well, there's some people who think that's a great idea, but um, yeah. you don't want that either. So. Yeah. Um, he says, if Paul speaks of this future reality as if it were something every child should know. Oh, did I uh, read that? No, he's just saying, making the same point again. Why is it so foreign to Christians today? Elsewhere, he says, if we endure. No, I did read that, didn't I? Right. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I think you're at the next, very next paragraph. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. When we can, we can, when we consider that mankind's reign on the earth is introduced in the first chapters of the Bible, mentioned throughout the Old Testament, discussed by Jesus in the Gospels, by Paul in the Epistles, and repeated by John in the Bible's final chapter, it is remarkable that we would fail to see it. <laughs> Remembering again that a crown speaks of ruling authority, consider the following examples from one small portion of Scripture, Revelation 2.5. Well, first, before I go into those, isn't, that is remarkable, isn't it? Where did I hear that before? <laughs> <laughs> We're finding it, as he said, uh, in, 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 the, in Genesis, 
uh, in Jesus, in Paul, in Re Book of Revelation, it's all through the scriptures, the idea that of us ruling and reigning the earth. And so why are people surprised by that? So um, we'll read these, these verses here that he cites to, to uh, make this point. It says, uh, and this is just in Revelations chapter 2 through 5. It says, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. To him who overcomes and does thy will to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, and I will, and I, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The 24 elders fall down before him who, sit, who sits on the throne. They lay their crowns before the throne. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. So over and over again, the, whole, whole, the same point is made again and again of us reigning and ruling. Right. <clears throat> Who does God say will reign? People of every tribe and language and people, people and nation. Where will they reign? On earth not in some intangible heavenly realm. Where on earth? Likely with people of their own tribe, language, and nation. Culture distinctives that we're told still exist on the new earth. Revelation 21, 24. We better check that out. Could you read Revelation 21, 24, and 26? And what, you see those verses cited there? Yeah, let me grab those. Revelation 21, 24 first. Revelation 21, 24. 21, 24, and verse 26 also. And verse 26. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 24 is, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And in verse 26, it says, And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Okay, so those when it, because it's it, it's still speaking in terms of nations. Mm -hmm. Randy is concluding that we we because we still have nations, that of course people will have these common uh, qualities that you have within a nation, in terms yes. of cult, culture, language, and whatever. Uh, and then also Revelation twenty two verse two. Twenty two verse verse two states, in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. It makes you a person wonder, since there will be nations in eternity, why is there a necessity to even be nations uh, if there no, are not distinctions between nations? Or... Will the nations just be dividing points where uh, individuals are, are ruling over, or, or will those nations still retain the qualities of a nation in terms of culture and the differences that we see today in nations? Uh, that's that's interesting. I mean, I honestly I don't know. I mean, I don't know what's going to differentiate you know, between the different nations. What's going to separate them? It would be. It seems to me it makes sense. Cultural differences. Of course, cultural differences that don't um, that don't go against uh, the biblical principles. You know, they they would be there. There are cultural things. We tend to focus as people on the things um, that that I don't like using the word religion, but by religious beliefs that separate us and make us different. But there are a lot of things that are um, part of cultures that have nothing to do with that. That simply make that culture different. Um, you know, mm -hmm. be it food or structure or or whatever. Um, there are there are a lot more differences to countries and cultures than simply religious belief. It's it's making me think about um, uh, will we retain culture, various cultures, and uh, there is a huge difference between one culture and another culture, and some people uh, really value and treasure the culture that they grew up in and that, and, and that, that, that their family has been in for maybe 
a long time, one family living within one culture. And I know personally there are certain cultural qualities that I really like and other culture qualities that I really don't like at all. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, uh, years ago I had a conversation with, with a person that he said, he said, Luke, I'm not a racist, but, but I am a culturist. Uh, and, you know, the, the way that uh, certain groups of people, uh, their culture is, I don't like the culture. It has nothing to do with their, if their ethnicity or, or their, uh, their skin or anything else. It's just the culture is something that I don't like. And he cited the, uh, the inner city cultures today of, of like, uh, you know, the drugs, the drugs, the promiscuity, the unmarried, the, the single mothers. And that, that seems to be a culture within many of our inner cities today. And he says, I don't like that culture. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with with a person's race. It's just the culture, the way that culture has evolved. So I think that some cult, a culture does not necessarily mean that it's something that is to be ideal to be retained. And then other qualities of culture, maybe there are things that are are very very beautiful that that people love and and want to retain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, personally, I'm hoping that there's no rapping uh, going on <laughs> uh, in heaven. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of it either. <laughs> But I mean, but it, but at the same time, it's like you know there are uh, you know, people who do that uh, with with the lyrics that uh, that are uh, Christian lyrics. So um, if it's your thing, it's it's like one of, it's one of those things. It's one of those things. You know, culturally, I don't like it. I don't go for it. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just not something I like. I just I don't yeah. go for that. I go for something else people, culturally. What about the people within that culture uh, that love it? And and as you said, maybe they would rap. Do rap music, but the message is beautiful and praising God and just beautiful, right. rather than rather than what we see about shooting cops and raping women. <laughs> right, exactly. And, right. I mean, and so, there's the. And if they if they love that culture and, and it was done in a beautiful way, uh, should that be taken away from the people and say that's that's a, you know, um, I, I, even though I don't like that, that is a cultural quality that. But uh, maybe within that culture, it'll be retained. Well, and there and there's another side to it too. We're kind of looking backward, but looking forward, maybe this has more to do with how the nations move forward in the future, in eternity. Um, they're going to be much different, and the way nations develop things. I mean, for instance, I mean, we kind of make some assumptions again based on not having education about the scripture, we make some assumptions, and maybe Randy's going to get into this in the, later in the book, but just to touch on it, um, you know, we don't know that, you know, possibly in eternity, there may be amazing technological things that we do. We, we assume, we, we, I, for some reason, biblically, we think of heaven, and we kind of tend to go backwards in time for some reason and think it's going to be very archaic and very basic, but it may actually involve technology and and may inv involve other things moving forward, you know, yes. used for common for a common well, good for people. That's that's part of uh, what when he says culture, he talks about within the culture you have the technology of those people, you have the education of those those people, you have their music, their art their science, all those things is part right. of that culture. Right. And, and uh, so, yeah, he will go into more detail in, in uh, okay. the chapters on all those things. But to me, uh, there are certain things within my culture that I like and things within my culture I don't like. And I, sure. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out, how much, if any, of this was going to be retained. Uh, Wayne Gruden... Gruden or Gr Grudem, Grudem. Mm -hmm. uh, states that when the author of Hebrews says that we do not yet see everything in subjection to man, Hebrews 2 verse 8, he implies that all things will eventually be subject to us under the kingship of the man, Christ Jesus. This will fulfill God's original plan to have everything in the world subject to the human beings that uh, he had made. In this sense, then, we will inherit the earth, Matthew 5, 5, and reign over it as God originally intended, unquote. Mm -hmm. So what is he saying there, that we're going to be ruling only because Jesus, as, as a man, will be ruling? I, I'm not sure I followed that. Did you?
Well, I think I think he's talking about as far as the Hebrews verse. He's saying you could slide a well, well, it, the not yet in there. He's making the point of saying that we don't see things in going in subjection under to us. Uh, right now, but eventually it will, because it's saying not yet. He says we do not yet see everything in subjection, <laughs> implying that it will happen later, um, and naturally that's got to happen under Christ, because we know He's King of King and Lord of Lords, and He's going to—it's all told through Scripture. He's going to rule the nations. So if things yeah. are going to be subjected to us, it's got to be under Him. Um, I guess this is probably a good point to stop. I'll make a note here. Uh, our the next point we'll pick up is our inheritance is owning and ruling the land. And uh, we'll, we'll pick up there next time. Okay. Uh, so we'll take a few minutes now to kind of rehash anything uh, that is real significant and, uh, and then tell people how that they can have this inheritance. Um, is there, is there anything that comes to mind that uh, we, we discussed today that is uh, uh, you think is uh, something you want to reemphasize? Well, I think we touched on a few things here that Christians who, who don't study their scripture as much as they should probably heard tonight for the first time. And um, it's in there. We've given you the references. You can search your scripture. You know, and again, Luke and I would both always say the same thing to anyone watching: is don't take our word for it. Go in your Bible and read it. You know, I'm. We don't have anything to hide from you. Um, go in your scripture, study your scripture. It's all in there. You'll find all this in there. Um, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at some of the things that you don't know. And when you think about you know, it, it it blows away a lot of the preconceived notions of what we think we should be or what we should have when we go into heaven and when we go into eternity. God is telling us through these verses how he's made us for so much more than our human expectations even are. You know, we, we it's so funny how we, we know our own failings to the point where we set our standard, we set the bar pretty low. <laughs> and we kind of, you know, we because we know ourselves, we, we know how, how we fail, we know what we're like at heart, you know. So we, it's, we have this natural inclination to set the bar really low. But God says, no, no, I've got all these great things prepared for you. Um, and it's not because you've earned it. It's because I want to do this and I want to bestow these blessings upon you. Okay, so I think that's a, that's an important thing to take away from from, from this message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it is interesting how our uh, now we talked about how sometimes people uh, take a, a a position uh, that is like why think about heaven? Just think about Jesus. In, in, in other words, but. We suspect that some of these people are, are, are stating that because it, they want to come off as being very pious. Right. Um, uh, there's nothing wrong with thinking about heaven and also thinking about Jesus, okay. and, and they go together. And then the other thing, of course, is the, uh, the idea that uh, we are going to co-reign. Of course, Jesus will rule and reign over us. And, and it's, but it's not only him ruling and reigning over us. We will rule and reign with him. Mm -hmm. And so that's hard for people to understand that we are going to have some varying responsibilities uh, and territories, land to rule over. And, mm -hmm. and this inheritance that when we, it says we are co-heirs, the, the inheritance we get is land. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, that, that's going to be very, very interesting how that plays out. And, and of course, these, uh, these rewards, the gold, silver, precious gems, the treasures in heaven, uh, these are the things that uh, are, uh, it's, it's worthwhile for us to work for in our ministries. And there's nothing wrong. Uh, my conclusion is that there's nothing uh, wrong. It is advisable to work hard after you become a Christian. Okay, now you've got the gift of eternal life. Now get to work. And see what you can do for Jesus, and you're going to store up treasures in heaven and earn all these gold and silver and precious gems and crowns. And the crowns mm -hmm. are uh, symbolic of us ruling over various cities and territories. So uh, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's pretty amazing, and it's far, far. The reality is far, far from uh, the world's perception of mm -hmm. heaven and our future. Absolutely. All right, well, uh, every show we, we talk about 
the wonders of heaven and eternity, and yet we never want to neglect to tell people, okay, if you're excited about this, if this is, now we got you excited about heaven, we want you to know what do you have to do so that you can receive this inheritance, so that you can be part of all this, uh, a co-heir. Uh, and the problem is, the vast majority, almost all people of the world believe that somehow they can get to in paradise or heaven if they just are good enough, if they work hard enough, somehow they can satisfy God and get there based upon their personal merit. God will judge them worthy if they're good enough. And we know that all the religions of the world are based upon that, and sadly, much of Christendom also is teaching that. But, but what is the reality? How does a person actually receive this uh, eternal life in heaven? Well, the, the, uh, the, the reality of it is that all those methods and all those things are futility. They show us, and this is what Christ demonstrates to, to us through his words in Scripture, in, in, in all those who tried to come to him, insinuating that they were following all the rules, that they were doing everything they needed to do. He demonstrated to them the futility of trying to do something like that, um, that man can't do these things on his own. And God doesn't expect man to do all these things on his own. He provides Christ in our stead, knowing that we can't do these things on our own, knowing that it's impossible. But as the scripture says, all things are possible with God. And God created that way through Jesus Christ. He took all those things that make us what we are as humans in this sinful life that we're in. Having sin in us, he took them and he nailed them to the cross along with Christ and shed his blood for us and he did and in doing that he did all the work that needed to be done any work any earning or any payment that had to be made for this was all done at that point and our only role in this whole thing is accepting that Christ did that on your behalf that's the only thing you need to do you need to admit to yourself I can't do this myself um, there's a saying, you can't be part of the solution if you're part of the problem. Well, we're part of the problem, so we can't be part of the solution. The solution has to be Jesus Christ. It has to be him. And all we have to do is trust in him that he did all the work, that he paid the price in full. And that's showing that we are subjecting ourselves to God by doing that. We're saying, I'm, I can't do this on my own. I must depend on you to do this for me. So you're saying, I trust you, Lord Jesus. I trust what you did for me. Amen. Amen. So, so if you're watching now and you've never put your faith completely in Jesus, uh, we're going to ask you to do it right now. Uh, just throw up your hands in defeat and accept that you cannot get into heaven through your own efforts. And there's nothing that you can do but instead put your fate, your future, in the hands of Jesus and trust him. Trust that he is able to give you eternal life and that he is faithful to give you eternal life. He promises eternal life in heaven to everyone who comes to him to receive it. So believe that he's able and faithful to do it and that's when he gives it to you. And now once you receive it, now you're going to have eternal life in heaven as we're describing it in these uh, sh shows. Uh, uh, and now what do you what do you want to receive in, in heaven? What kind of treasures? and uh, crowns do you want? Well, if you want some of those things, then get busy working for Jesus. There's where our works come into play. Uh, once we put our faith in Jesus, he gives us eternal life as a free gift. Now get busy working so that you can build up those treasures in heaven. Okay? Amen. I, ho I hope you do it. And if you do it, uh, make a comment on the video, and we'd love to hear about it. Uh, we will celebrate uh, if you... Uh, uh, if this video help you to understand this free gift of eternal life. Okay, brother, thank you for being here with us. Uh, I see that uh, Brother Mike has joined us, so uh, he can t have a nice talk with us in the after show. Uh, so everybody who's watching, thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.